worth millions, breathtaking diamonds that will take years to procure, a job for only the finest jewelers, a necklace for a queen, a necklace for only the finest, and a necklace to cost her life. In the years leading up to the French Revolution, Marie Antoinette was a suspicious figure to the French public. Salacious gossip and rumor followed the young queen irrespective of her choices. Yet if we look at the timeline of events, Marie Antoinette's actions may have had little to do with her fate. In fact, it could be all down to jewelry meant for someone else. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we examine the necklace that cost Marie Antoinette her head. Marie Antoinette faced an arduous task as Queen of France. Following her husband, Louis XVI's ascension to the throne in 1774, Marie Antoinette, just 19, was made monarch to a country and public that had grown notorious for its attacks on the monarchy. The young queen found herself treated with suspicion and accusation by the infamous Libelle of 18th century France. These highly publicized pamphlets characterized her as a sympathizer of France's enemies, a profligate spender, and a woman of lousy virtue. Her reputation was somewhat elevated to the public eyes by her years of marriage and bearing the king's children, but the scandal of 1785 would do damage from which she could not recover. The scandal, forever known as the Affair of the Queen's Necklace, would unfold on Marie Antoinette from 1784 through the following year. Years previous in 1772, Louis XV had the most grandiose of gifts arranged for his mistress, Madame du Berry. He demanded Bémer and Bassanger, the finest jewelers in Paris, to create a diamond necklace of value never seen before, in today's money worth over $15 million. The unimaginable necklace took years to prepare, and during that time, Louis XV died of smallpox, and Madame du Barry was expelled from the royal court. In an ironic turn of events, the 17 diamond piece was offered to Marie Antoinette, who turned it down not once, but twice from her husband Louis XVI. However, there were other actors in the French royal court with designs for the jewelry and for themselves. The $15 million necklace had caught the attention of Jean de la Motte, a confidence trickster trying to climb her way up French high society. In 1785, Cardinal de Rohan took Jean de la Motte as his mistress. Both were desperate to earn the good favor of the queen. Ultimately, de la Motte was more astute at playing the game than the hopeless cardinal could ever dream to be. The confidence trickster was able to fake correspondence from the queen to the cardinal. Amazingly, the cardinal bought it, even the surprisingly warm tone of the letters, falling for the queen in the process. De Lamotte, on the other hand, continued to take money from her cardinal lover and mingle among the French nobility. Backing it in her false correspondence, De Lamotte informed the cardinal that the queen wanted to purchase the necklace, but for the cardinal to take care of the matter out of public view. The two million livre necklace was purchased and to be paid in installments the cardinal negotiating this on a faked signature by de la Motte. Upon receiving the necklace, de la Motte made short work of the fine jewelry. Its magnificent stones she soon sold at black markets in London and Paris. Marie Antoinette would soon be presented a bill for a $15 million necklace she didn't purchase, didn't ask for, and didn't buy. Irrespective of the fate of the famed necklace, a lifetime of dishonesty did not appear to do much for Jean de Lamotte's karma. While many accomplices, unknowing or otherwise, in the plot received either exile or acquittal, Lamotte was found guilty and served up the harshest of punishments. Not only sentenced to life imprisonment, but Jean de Lamotte was also branded and whipped before being sent to the Salpetriere. The lifetime drifter that any con artist is, Lamotte escaped prison, disguising herself as a boy, no less, and traveled to London, releasing her memoir in 1789. Lamotte's underground life took no change of direction in Britain. She died in August of 1791, having suffered extensive injuries falling from a hotel window, on the run from debt collectors. Early in its formation, the Times would print the ghastly state de Lamotte was left in, a broken arm, two broken legs, and a removed eye. Lamotte may have escaped the punishment of the authorities, but fate seemed to have other ideas. Marie Antoinette couldn't catch a break. 
The monarchs insisted on a trial to clear their names and publicly shame the culpable parties. But that isn't how things turned out. Public opinion could not be turned away from its suspicion of the queen. Despite the trial clearly outlying the cardinal as a patsy for Jean de Lamotte's deception over the queen, many in France thoroughly believed otherwise. The counterclaim held in public belief was Lamotte was used as a patsy by Antoinette to slander her enemy, Cardinal de Rohan. Unfortunately for Marie Antoinette, the trial proceedings only added to this perspective. The cardinal's acquittal by the king left the public presuming that the queen had some form of involvement in the plot. This was furthered by her openly showing displeasure in the acquittal. Lamotte, despite her malevolent actions, was seen sympathetically by the French public. The monarchy and Marie Antoinette, however, would never recover from the scandal. Though the necklace and its labyrinthine story passed, Marie Antoinette's public derision only grew. The facts of the case didn't matter. The fact that she had twice turned the necklace down, first and foremost on financial grounds, did not gain a foothold in the public psyche. What had previously been suspicion and distrust only developed into more open derision and hatred. The Queen had to cancel all public appearances following the scandal. Despite it being the counter-opposite of the truth, her image as a vain, manipulative wastrel had been cemented. The French populace were convinced their Queen was more concerned with her own ends than their welfare. Louis XVI would draw closer to his wife personally and politically as the public soured. But as they would soon find, it was all too late. The affair of the Queen's necklace would fire up flames much grander than any in the monarchy could possibly imagine. Some of the very same literature and pamphlets used to defame the Queen would carry sentiments on which the French Revolution was built. Marie Antoinette had become a symbol of an excessive old regime in need of change. France had several financial problems, expensive wars, a mass royal family all paid for by the state, and a sprawling nobility unwilling to cut back or pay taxes all contributed. Though Marie Antoinette shouldered the overwhelming blame, the national face of fraud was labeled Madame Déficit. Somehow in France's public imagination, Marie Antoinette had single-handedly ruined the country's economy. Though it should be said the queen didn't help herself. Efforts of reform she either ignored, avoided, or tried to install her own people to garner reforms protecting her cut. Estimates produced showed the queen costing as much as 7% of the state budget. Yet sources say this was a worked number to avoid revealing the actual figure. In October 1789, the coming revolution had gained steam. The royal family was placed under house arrest at the Tuileries Palace. Their attempted escape two years later, in June of 1791, did nothing to help their cause. The year following, on September 22, 1792, France abolished its monarchy. Come 1793, to bid farewell to the Ancien Régime, both Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were trialed and executed by guillotine. Marie Antoinette, a scapegoat woman in a man's world, to be sure. A king would not face the same flack and personal scrutiny this young queen did, and certainly her lavish spending was no worse than many of her royal contemporaries. Maybe it was being a woman that made the hateful public image stick. Maybe that's what's left her the doomed queen. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.